Welcome to another beautiful summer day in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm, I'm Bruce Katz. I'm the vice president uh, at the Brookings Institution, and I'm co-director of the Metropolitan Policy Program. And I just wanted to welcome you to today's forum on can-do states. And we're, we're really happy to have leaders from around the country, uh, public and private sector, uh, friends from Canada, friends from Puerto Rico, uh, to really discuss how they're financing critical infrastructure projects during what we all know is a very disruptive uh, economic and, and fiscal period. Um, you, you know the worldview, I think, for, for some of you, the, from the Metropolitan Program. Uh, cities and metropolitan areas, particularly the top 100 metropolitan areas, are really the engines of our economy, the centers of our trade and investment, uh, the vehicles for environmental sustainability. Uh, State-of-the-art infrastructure is an essential driver of competitiveness, job creation, innovation. And from private sector investments in telecommunication, energy projects, pipelines, to traditionally public-funded investments in transportation, water, public buildings, and parks, our nation's infrastructure is the backbone of a healthy economy. So today, record low interest rates, coupled with attention from private firms and foreign funds, present growing opportunities for pragmatic public and private sector leaders to collaborate, to compete, and innovate around infrastructure investments at the metropolitan scale, and to motivate state and federal officials to support these efforts. And the good news, and you know, when you live in Washington, D.C., there's not a lot of good news in this town, but the good news is networks of leaders in many states and metropolitan areas are driving the development of new and innovative ways to deliver economically important, economically critical infrastructure projects. They're finding better ways to design, finance, and deliver these investments on time and on budget. Modern freight and logistics projects in L.A. and Miami, state-of-the-art transit investments in Denver and Salt Lake City, advanced stormwater treatment upgrades in Philadelphia and New York, border crossings in San Diego, and Detroit, they're all emblematic of the growing role that states and cities are taking to build the infrastructure that will both support and enable the next American economy. So let, this be, let us be clear, uh, they're doing all these things in the absence of clear federal leadership and reliable, stable, predictable, and flexible funding and authority. The innovation we will showcase today is therefore the vanguard of policy progress in America. We all know that many states and metros still struggle with financial, regulatory, institutional hurdles that slow or block the deliver of essential infrastructure assets. Uh, they also struggle, as, as we've talked about just at a breakfast this morning, with the capacity of staff uh, to oversee many of these things. Uh, our goal today is not just to honor the exception, but to distill replicable models that can teach other states and metros to bring disparate funding programs together and use legislation, smart legal frameworks, smart procurement, dedicated support teams uh, to bring the private sector on board as a partner and food, find new ways to collaborate regionally. Uh, we all know uh, the way we talk about our country. States are the laboratories of democracy. Uh, cities and metros are the centers of innovation. So if we can invent these new models and we can spread them around the country, uh, then we ultimately can scale them and have the kind of federal and national policies that we need and deserve as a modern economy. Thank you very much. And now I will introduce Rob Puentes, the uh, director of our Metropolitan Infrastructure Initiative and an inspiration to me on a daily basis. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Bruce. Really appreciate that. Um, and good morning, everybody, and thank you all for, for being here today. Thank you for those who are watching us on the, uh, on the webcast, and uh, thanks especially to the folks here in the room. It's a really great group, very, very substantive, as we said to folks earlier, um, very wonky. We mean that in a very good way um, for us here at Brookings. Um, uh, I think that the, 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 the interest that we've seen in this is really testament to the fact, as Bruce said, that there is such this hunger out there right now um, from folks trying to learn what's going on around the country, as Bruce said, not just the exceptions, but how to make those things more the rule um, all throughout the nation. How do we get these ideas? How do we replicate them? How do we have them ripple throughout the system? Um, and how do we make that part of 
standards of how we're doing things and not just, uh, and not just the exceptions. Um, so much palpable desire, I think, to hear about these rules, the tools, and the institutions that are now the states are putting, are putting in place. Some of it's an absence of federal, uh, of federal roles, but all this designed to help cities uh, and metropolitan areas as we recover uh, our economy. So this event really couldn't come at a better time. You know, we all know that, uh, that infrastructure is a critical piece um, for our national economic recovery, how we're going to put Americans back to work. It really is that economic frame which is part of infrastructure, which I think is really helping drive it to the forefront uh, of the national conversations. When it's still an infrastructure conversation, it's going to be in the back burner. Uh, we talked a little bit about this also at breakfast this morning. An infrastructure conversation among infrastructure people is helpful. You know, it's good, line, good bottom line for some people's business, but it's not going to get us the change and the economic um, transformation that we all know that we need. So while the discussion, you know, here in Washington is strained, I think, to say the least, we are encouraged by the innovation and the, uh, the experimentation and the new things that we're seeing happening in states, cities, and metropolitan areas um, all across the country. Uh, I don't want to be Pollyannish about this. We know that states are, you know, even though they're doing better from a budgetary perspective, they're still wrestling with their own challenges, their own fiscal challenges, and their own political challenges. There, many are still politically gridlocked. Many are still having a hard time um, getting things done. Um, but we do think that there is this pragmatic caucus of city, state, civic, corporate, philanthropic, public sector leaders that are emerging all around the country that are really focused on getting, as Bruce would say, getting stuff done. Actually, he wouldn't say stuff. He would say getting, getting something else done. But nevertheless, I think you get the point. Um, so uh, let me just start then. So we have a great panel that's going to help us kind of walk through some of those things. What I wanted to do was just to provide some overall framing remarks um, to kind of get us started um, and to set the context for the discussion um, that's, that's here today. The first thing is that as cities, states, and metropolitan areas act to capitalize on new opportunities uh, in trade, in services, and production, we know that infrastructure is a really critical part of that national conversation. Over the past three years, a growing chorus of business leaders and mainstream economists have embraced a post-recession growth model for a next American economy. So here we're talking about an economy that's fueled by innovation, not only to spur growth through idea generation, but through the virtuous interplay of invention, commercialization, and manufacturing. It should be powered by a lower carbon economy or lower carbon energy to position the United States at the vanguard of the next innovation-led industrial revolution. It should be driven by exports to take advantage of the rising global demand that we all know is out there for quality products and services and to be responsive to these massive changes that are underway in the global economy. And it should be opportunity rich so that working families can earn wages sufficient to sustain a middle class life. Infrastructure is a critical driver to each of these elements of the next American economy. From private sector driven investments in things like telecommunications and energy uh, and pipelines to traditionally public sector investments in transportation and water or social infrastructure like public buildings and the partnerships that are building bridges between the public and private sectors, our nation's infrastructure is the backbone to a healthy economy. Our competitors, we talked about this at breakfast this morning, our competitors in mature and emerging markets alike are in the process of making these kinds of investments and by so doing, catalyzing productive and sustainable growth. However, the challenge, as we all know, here in the U.S. is that insufficient and misaligned investment in infrastructure has real consequences for the nation's ability to compete globally. According to the World Economic Forum, U.S. infrastructure has fallen from best in the world to 25th in the span of just 10 years. So we really need to think how, why, and through what kind of partnerships we're going to build out our next generation infrastructure. So for example, growing an innovation economy, as we mentioned, is, not going, to require, is going to require not only the generation of cutting edge ideas in advanced universities and in research labs, but the creation of smart and sustainable cities that combine telecommunications technology to integrate public services, connect citizens, and enhance productivity. Growing a lower carbon economy will require not only the invention of new technologies, but the construction of renewable energy facilities, the infrastructure to store that energy, and power new sustainable products like electric vehicles, and the construction and retrofit of buildings to radically reduce energy use. Growing an export economy will require not only the opening up of foreign markets for American goods and services, but building and retooling the next generation of advanced production facilities and the underlying infrastructure to move goods, 
ideas, and workers quickly and efficiently by air, rail, sea, cable, pipeline, everything else. And growing an economy that is opportunity rich will require us to make job access part of transportation policy. Because while we definitely need more jobs and we need better jobs, we also need to make sure that those jobs are accessible and people can actually get to the jobs that they need. So restructuring the economy requires us, in essence, to remake cities and metros for a productive rather than a consumption economy and for a sustainable rather than a wasteful society. All of these elements, then, of the next economy have their own distinctive spatial presence and footprint, and they also connect to each other by multiple complementary types of infrastructure. This is a more holistic vision of the infrastructure building, uh, of infrastructure building than the one that's dominated the way that we did this over the last 25 years in the United States. The problem is that this new model is really messy, it's really complicated, it's multidimensional, has lots of partnerships, but we think this is the reality of really what's going to drive modern economies. So with that as a frame, the, the question for us today is, where is the investment in the next generation of infrastructure going to come from? We think much of it is going to come from the private sector, and there is a great story to tell in things like telecommunications and freight rail uh, and energy, all of these things that are traditionally private sector driven. And while we do believe that the federal government should play a strong role, uh, there does appear to be a structural change in the federal budget when it comes to discretionary spending, with things like infrastructure, housing, and defense all getting squeezed out. Their share of federal spending is forecast to fall from over one-third to less than a quarter in just the next decade, with mandatory programs like Social Security uh, and interest payments all expected to expand. So partly because of that, uh, we do see a handful of states, we call them the, the can-do states, that are working to develop the new rules, new tools, and new institutions to fund and finance infrastructure projects and engage in new kinds of problem solving. However, when it comes to the rules, uh, many states are missing the enabling legislation to execute complex infrastructure deals, especially around public-private partnerships. Or else the infrastructure or the, the legislation is too limiting and focused only on individual projects. Others lack the institutional experience or the political alignment to develop the right kind of projects and negotiate complex deals while fully protecting the public interest while still adhering to uh, complex public policy goals. As a result, private sector leaders that we talk to believe there are only a handful of states in which they can really do business without too much of that risk. Increasingly, private, uh, public infrastructure investment is also occurring through state revolving loan funds and so-called infrastructure banks. While they are not-for-profit institutions in the traditional banking context, they rely on load repayments, bonds, interest, and fees to ideally recapitalize and replenish the fund as a perpetual source of debt financing. These institutions support a broad array of projects. For example, in 1987, when the federal government phased out clean water construction grants, every state established revolving funds as a mechanism for leveraging additional public and private sector dollars. Clean energy funds exist in 22 states, mostly in the Northeast, and have invested nearly $3 billion in renewable energy markets and leveraged an additional $10 billion in federal and private capital. They've supported over 72,000 projects from solar installations to wind farms to biomass energy uh, regeneration plants. Nearly half of the states have functioning transportation infrastructure banks capitalized initially by the federal government that provide below market revolving loans and loan guarantees. Since established in the 1990s, they've provided billions of dollars in financing for more than 1,000 projects, mostly focused in the top 100 metropolitan areas. And 10 states have other kinds of funds for a variety of infrastructure projects, all of these off the federal books. Now, for all of these examples, we know that we're not talking about free money. Loans have to be repaid. Debts, of course, have to be repaid. So states are also continuing to raise their own revenue through traditional means like taxes, user fees, as well as still taking advantage of tax-free debt. But they're also doing more with less by coordinating their agencies to streamline project delivery and starting slowly, but still starting to align their work on infrastructure with state, city, and metropolitan economic development policy and practice. So the bottom line for us and for the discussion today is that despite these challenges, as we mentioned at the beginning, we are seeing creativity in states and metro areas that have figured out ambitious and creative ways to design, finance, and deliver infrastructure projects on time and on budget. All the projects that Bruce mentioned uh, in his remarks are in various stages of development, and we truly believe these things are just the tip of the iceberg. 
So in order to catalyze the development of next generation infrastructure, states are recognizing that there is no cavalry coming and they're going to have to raise their own revenue. For example, states as diverse as Wyoming, Maryland, and Vermont all recently raised taxes to pay for transportation investments. But in addition to traditional sources and debt markets, revolving funds, trusts, and innovative bonding mechanisms are producing new practices in the field of infrastructure finance. Connecticut, for example, recently created a clean energy finance and investment authority that combines several different funds, enabling them to be leveraged and for private actors to invest with a promised financial return. Florida State Infrastructure Bank uh, chooses projects that have the most secure sources of funding, as well as safeguards to repay loans, which keeps it functioning from year to year instead of sending out grants and not having the, the fund replenished. But states also need to work on and setting the rules for the proper regulatory environment to clear the way for new infusions of capital and streamline project delivery. This year, Maryland passed legislation that modifies procurement rules to allow the state to more easily consider public-private partnerships for a range of capital investments from schools to roads and transit to ports and water. California is streamlining its bureaucracy by combining agencies and reorganizing departments specifically to overcome the technical barriers that slow or even derail certain projects. And in New York, they're pursuing public-public partnerships by developing common planning, prioritization, and investment criteria across infrastructure types to cut down on red tape and speed project delivery. We're going to hear a lot about New York uh, in just a bit. So the third thing is that for states to take advantage of public-private partnerships for infrastructure, they need to craft new institutions to help with quality control, technical assistance, standardization, promotion, and policy guidance. We all know that the United States is a latecomer in the field of public-private partnerships, and state, but some states have been very active in the last three years in building capacity and really starting to truly close deals. In just a bit, we're going to hear from Virginia and Colorado and their specialized offices that provide the support and technical assistance needed all the way from procurement through the long-term management of these funds or of these kinds of projects. Yet while establishing an individual PPP framework is important, only a consistent and predictable pipeline of projects can ensure private investors' continued engagement in U.S. infrastructure markets. This is why we think that innovative multi-state partnerships like the West Coast Infrastructure Exchange hold so much promise. The WCX, made up of stakeholders from California, Oregon, Washington and British Columbia is establishing a common market for infrastructure projects, facilitating procurements, and creating a project clearinghouse for regional infrastructure investments. And we're going to hear a lot about WCX here at the end as well. So the goal for us, and really what we want to do here at this event today, is to learn from these states, learn from these handful of, of can-do states, and truly go to make us a can-do nation once again. So let me close by bringing us to today. As we're seeing city, state, and metropolitan leaders are taking increasing responsibility for their infrastructure agendas, they're experimenting and developing the new rules, tools, and institutions necessary to facilitate transformative infrastructure investments that really respond to the current moment. While no single state has addressed all of these challenges, and many are definitely still adrift, a few are taking very encouraging and productive and proactive steps.